Welcome to Stock Price Behavior and Market Efficiency. When we talk about an efficient market, we're basically contending that the market reflects all publicly available information at a given point in time. Um, if you are able to beat the market, what does that mean? It basically means an individual return is greater than the market return. More specifically, we might even say controlling for risk. A company return outperforms a market return. That will ultimately become what the Jensen's ratio later on in Finance 410 is how we will measure that more specifically. Um, there's three different versions of market efficiency, at least for an academic. A weak form efficient market reflects all past stock price information. So there's basically no trends or patterns that will be repeated in the future. Semi-strong form market efficiency implies that it implies all weak form in addition to all publicly available information is reflected in stock prices. That set being said is you can't look at, say, a annual report that's publicly available and find any new information that's not going to be reflected in the stock price. And the most stringent form of stock market efficiency is the strong form, implying that stock prices reflect both private and public information. Um, for the most part, if you do have inside information, it's probably likely that you could profit from that if you know the company is going to announce something horrible tomorrow. If you sell the price at a price today, you'd probably profit from that. Um, similarly, um, if you knew a great announcement was going to come, you could buy today before the announcement became public. So, and for the most part, insider trading is illegal. We'll talk about that here shortly. But for the most part, most people don't believe the market is strong form efficient. Many academics believe markets are semi-strong form, but then technical analysts don't even think the market's weak form. They can find patterns and trends that will repeat in the future. Okay, in terms of page two, why would a market be efficient? The driving force we're going to say is related to the profit motive. For example, the Fidelity Magellan Fund has $17 billion under management. If they were to outperform the market by 0.2%, what would that imply? Well, that would imply 0.2% times 17 billion, that would be like an excess return of 34 million. So Fidelity is willing to spend up to $34 million to find that excess return. So there's a lot of investment into finding these abnormal returns to the extent that they can be very profitable. Even a small percentage increase when you're managing a lot of money produces a very large excess profit. And so because of that, a lot of people are in the finance business trying to find undervalued assets or overvalued assets and profiting from their purchase or sale accordingly. Um, if a market is efficient, security selection wouldn't be that important. It would be most important to hold an index fund. And so that should give you the market return if you just hold an index fund. So whether you hold company X or company Y, it would be more important just to hold an index fund to get the market return. The need for money managers would be down. If all you got to do is hold the index, you wouldn't need people to find individual stocks. And then finally, um, you shouldn't try to time the market. If stock prices reflect all publicly available information, the stock prices at any given point in time should be efficient. You shouldn't wait for them to fall and then buy low or rise and sell high. Um, there's a good textual description of how old information, whether or not old information helps predict future stock prices and random walks. Uh, what we like to talk about next is how does new information get into stock prices? What does that look like? Visually, we're going to say that you're bebopping along and then all of a sudden there's some new information. It's a positive information. The stock price should jump up immediately and then stay at that new level. This dark line is the efficient market reaction to positive news. We, an inefficient market would say, well, this is good news. And then there's buying opportunities here for six days. Um, an overreaction would be there's good news and all of a sudden the price goes way up above and then eventually corrects itself over the course of the next several days. This, these dotted lines would not be efficient market reactions. This is sort of an overreaction, this is an underreaction. Profit opportunities shouldn't exist after the information becomes public. The stock price should jump up immediately and stay at that new level. Um, for an example of how this might look, let's look at ticker QLYS. If we look at ticker QLYS, it just so happens they have been reporting higher than expected earnings for 
an entire year now. I want to look at these last two more specifically. So in December, analysts thought they were going to report 18 cents a share. They actually reported 37 cents. What happened to their stock price on that day? Well, here's QLYS's price. They announced it on the 12th. Here's the day before, here's the day after. So the price basically went from 59.90 to 67.30. And you might say, well, what happened to the market? Did the market also go up 12%? We look at what happened in the market return between February 9th and February 12th. The market did go up, but certainly not as much. If we calculated it more specifically, on the between the 12th, going from the day before to the day after, QLYS went up 12%, the market went up 2%. We go back to October, QLYS, when they announced higher than expected earnings, their price went up 7%. The market was basically flat. Um, let's see, I wanted to show one other thing. Ah, you could say, well, what about their beta? What is, because that's not, that's just comparing QLYS to the market without adjusting for risk. Maybe QLYS IS is very risky and so they have a high beta. Just to check on that, if we go to this QSY tab, and just look at their beta. It's, Yahoo's reporting it as two, so it should be twice as high. So going back here, we say, well, the market was up 1.7, all else equal, QLY should have been up 3.4. Well, they went up 12.4. So there is that new earnings, that new information, higher than expected earnings, increased their price pretty quickly. Then same type of thing here. 2 times 0.3 is 0.6, and then it went up 6.9. So there's a much larger increase based on that new information when it became public. The stock price jumped up in QLYS's case. So that's kind of what we're referring to when we see this sort of jump up, and then theoretically it stays at that higher level. All right, here's where we're going to talk a little bit about this idea of insider versus informed trading. You are allowed to do informed trading, that is using publicly available information, conducting analysis and making decisions based on that. There's nothing wrong with doing informed trading. Where you're running into trouble is when you start dealing with non-public information. If you happen to know your buddy working at a given corporation and know that they've just uncovered some really bad stuff and their stock price is going to fall once this becomes widely known, if you start short selling that stock, you're committing an illegal insider trading. That's illegal in the United States. So it's anytime you're dealing with non-public information, that's when you got to concern yourself with trading. Using public available information, there's, that's perfectly acceptable, and that's sort of the profit and competition motive that should drive prices to be their efficient levels. Okay, turns out markets are pretty efficient in the long run, but there are some short-run problems. For example, some anomalies. Um, the day of the week effect. Turns out, on average, Monday has a negative average return. That's odd, especially given that there's an upward trajectory in stock prices and the markets are only open Monday through Friday. You would think Monday, of all days of the week, should have the highest average return if it were to built in sort of Saturday's growth and Sunday's growth combined with Monday's growth on average. Um, but the anomaly is that Monday is always negative. That basically creates a profit opportunity. Sell on Friday, buy on Monday, and you should be able to profit from that. Once this finding became known, that day of the week effect did diminish because people started selling on Friday, buying on Monday, to, and that basically drove prices down Friday, drove prices up Monday to sort of eliminate that effect. But in any case, that was an anomaly. A calendar month, January effect, relates to small company stocks having an abnormally high average return in the month of January. Again, this was a interesting finding to sort of refute market efficiency. January is no different from any other month. Why should January be especially high for small company stocks? Um, once that became widely known, the January effect has dissipated. So that's it's both an argument against market efficiency, but also a market in, an argument in favor. Once it became publicly known, um, the people's published a paper on it. Once it became publicly known, that effect disappeared. The earnings announcement puzzle kind of relates to that QLYS example. We should expect to see, let's see if I can do this, this, higher than expected earnings bump, higher level, higher than expected earnings bump, higher level. What we actually see, if we were to look at QLS, they're kind of going generally up. Let me get a hold of here. This is too short a period of time. 
they're basically trending up even without these. There are the earnings announcement dates where you get the bumps, but whether or not they're staying high, they sort of seem to be trending upward, even in between dates. We'd have to do a slightly more empirically uh, valid assessment of that, but it doesn't look quite as choppy there. It looks more of a general trend line than it does to be sort of a stair step, in my opinion. But in any case, that's this earnings announcement puzzles that earnings tend to continue to go up even after the information becomes public. All right, a couple other examples of things that markets are efficient. Why on earth do they crash? Um, bubbles are when prices sort of get overinflated and then they crash back down to reality. A couple prospectus warning signs from history. In the 1720s, there was actually a prospectus that said, here's what the, a company for carrying on an undertaking of great advantage, but nobody to know what it is. If you don't know what it is, I would say it's very risky to invest in that. Basically, the story, the moral of that story was that guy took all the money and just disappeared, never to be heard from again. In the 1960s, in the biotech and electronics boom, there was a warning. This company has no assets or earnings and will be unable to pay dividends in the foreseeable future. The shares are highly risky. That type of description, to me, would say, yeah, I might not want to stake my claim for that particular company. Um, and then we've talked already previously in class about some amplifiers to return. Things like call options and buying on margin can amplify return. They can also drive prices up to bubblish level. Um, the tulip bulb craze, one of the first bubbles and crashes widely known in the 1630s was exacerbated by call options. In the 1920s in the United States, buying on the margin is what kind of drove up stock prices so high during the roaring 20s. The crash in 1929 is one of the most famous stock market crashes. Big collapse in October. Using GE as an example, it went from like 128 up to nearly 400. Up 200% stock market crash, it's down to 168. Here's what was sort of unique about the 1929 crash is that it kept on going down. Price for GE, for example, kept going from 168 all the way down to the low in 1932 of 8 before it started to climb back up. Now, GE is still with us today. If you were to sort of hold long term, I suppose, but if you were to bought here and sold here, you would have lost 98% of your investment. Um, the Asian stock market crash, 1990. We get this peak in 1990 collapse, and it still hasn't recovered. This is to today. This is 1990 to today. So if you were to buy the Nikkei stock market index in 1990, it has collapsed and still has not recovered to this day. In the United States, again, dot com, sort of like internet company stocks, sort of bubbled up, collapsed, and they've basically now recovered for the most part. However, that took 15 years from 2000 to 2015 get to their pre-crash levels. Um, two different stories, Cisco, Amazon. Let's see if we can look those up relatively quickly. Um, if we go over here and look for Cisco and see what is their stock price look like. Here is that stock market bubble. Cisco at one point was one of the world's most valuable companies. Uh, it collapsed and still hasn't recovered. It's kind of their individual story is similar to the Asian stock market crash. So the internet bubble has had a large effect on Cisco. Let's check out Amazon as well for a comparison. If you look at Amazon today, the stock market crash is like barely perceptible. It's there, they crashed, but their stock has gone up so dramatically since then that that little crash there is just sort of a blip in the history of Amazon. So two different rea long-term reactions to what were, most people would consider, overvalued stocks in the terms of the internet boom of the late 1990s. More recently, the crash of 2008, that was basically caused by loose lending standards um, in the United States, the most famous of which is probably the ninja loans, where you have no income, no job, and no assets, that's fine, we'll still give you a mortgage loan. You can buy a house, no questions asked. Um, that type of lending led to very high home prices. Well, if I don't have to pay for this thing or I don't have to qualify for this thing, I'm willing to pay a higher price. 
and people just started buying, 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 buying. Eventually, the, when real estate prices crashed, this is real estate prices. When they crashed, that led to a stock market crash. Suddenly, everyone's wealth was diminished and stock prices crashed. Primarily, financial institutions led that. The lending institutions that were lending to people who weren't able to pay create a big problem, financially speaking. Um, a nice film based on that scenario uh, called The Big Short. There were a few people who did look at this trend and say, you know what? Prices are overvalued. We're going to sell short. When they collapse, we will make money off it. So that's the, t the basis for the title, The Big Short, written by Michael Lewis. It's actually a pretty good book and a pretty good film. I would encourage you to at least watch the film because that's, that's within your lifetimes. It was, you were young, but that's a recent economic history bubble and crash. In addition, at this summary, there's all kinds of innovations that lead to real increases. Railroads, radio, electronics, biotechnology, the internet. However, when they first come out, they sort of have bubblish prices that crash for the most part. How can you figure out how to invest at a fair price? That's a tricky situation. I don't know that I know the full-blown answer to that other than let's try to work through some of these problems and see if we can become more familiar with some of the history and some of the definitions related to market efficiency when we'll discuss any conclusions we come to in class. So good luck with Chapter 7, and we'll discuss this further in class.